Atomic energy was one of the most important breakthroughs of the 20th century. The mastery of this tremendous force gave mankind many new opportunities, which of course immediately found military use. However, over time, the scientists who created the most destructive weapon in history found more peaceful missions for this force. So the nuclear power industry appeared. Since then, decades have passed, full of bright triumphs and terrible disasters. But the last few decades, this industry went on without any bright achievements, at least from the point of view of regular people. In reality though, the industry is moving, and today we will get acquainted with a slightly exotic direction of its development. Floating nuclear power plants. What is it? Conceptually, floating nuclear power plants are ships equipped with nuclear reactors. In principle, this technology itself is nothing new. Atomic icebreakers plowing the endless white fields of cold seas, huge aircraft carriers, flagships of the fleets, and of course strategic submarines, the presence of nuclear reactors on which is already considered standard practice. The main difference of floating power plants is that their reactors are designed not only to provide energy to the ships themselves, but also to supply this energy to external consumers. The idea of creating such power plants appeared almost immediately after the deployment of nuclear power to the sea. Floating power plants were already in demand. There are many regions that, on the one hand, have industrial enterprises, bases and residential areas that require a lot of energy, and on the other, make it very difficult to build full flash power plants there. Back in the 1960s, some countries created floating power plants based on conventional fuels, and the nuclear reactor seemed a logical solution. In 1967, such a vessel was created in the USA on the basis of an ordinary Liberty-class cargo ship. The ship, named MH-1 Sturgis, was equipped with a single 10-megawatt reactor. After all the tests, the floating reactor was sent to the Panama Canal Zone. An excellent example of potential use. A huge infrastructure facility that required a lot of energy with nowhere to get it from. There, Sturgis spent seven years providing energy to the critical elements of this megastructure. In 1975, a conventional power plant was finally built on the canal and the ship returned home. On the one hand, its application was considered successful. There were no serious problems and Sturgis in principle completed its task. On the other hand, it was nevertheless a modification of an ordinary vessel, which did not ideally suit the new task. The reactor on it was low power and the maintenance was complicated. Once a year, the ship had to be disabled for the reactor refueling. In the end, its work was not continued. The ordinary fuel generators turned out to be simpler and cheaper. But almost half a century has passed since then. Technology has taken a step forward, and perhaps now we can revive this topic and do something more promising. This task was taken up by the Russian Rosatom Corporation. The Russian Federation, being a northern country, has vast and extremely difficult to develop territories. However, these territories are very important, since they are where the huge reserves of natural resources are located. From the point of view of logistics, these places are a problem. They are very far away, and building roads through thousands of kilometers of frozen ground is an almost impossible task. The only promising way to solve this transportation problem is the sea. These territories lay on the shores of the Arctic Ocean, which will soon become the basis of a large transport corridor, both between the regions of the north of Russia and from Asia to Europe. To implement large-scale development plans, it is necessary to create infrastructure there, which is extremely challenging. And the biggest problem is the energy shortage. Building classic power plants is very difficult. The idea to create a power plant that does not need constant fuel supply and deliver it there seemed quite logical. Actually, floating nuclear power plants were interesting in the USSR back in the 1970s, but work was being carried out slowly, and after the collapse of the country, all these projects were practically forgotten. They were remembered only in the early 2000s. Finally, we will talk about how they developed this technology. Akademik Lomonosov is the new solution, the first Russian floating nuclear power plant. The vessel is 144 meters or 474 feet long, 30 meters or 98 feet wide, and has a displacement of about 21,500 tons. To make it more epic, I would like to say that this is a huge structure, but objectively it turned out relatively compact. Moreover, Lomonosov is not a ship, but a non-self-propelled power barge. It is, for the most part, a fixed anchored station, so it makes no sense for it to have its own propulsion system. The barge is being moved by tugboats, provided at the right time. Therefore, its appearance is quite simple. 
Lomonosov looks like a hefty floating building, seaworthy performance was not a priority during the development. The barge is divided into three main parts. In the center, under a large superstructure, there is a reactor compartment that generates thermal energy. In the bow, there is generator equipment, with two steam turbine units that process thermal energy into electrical. In the aft parts respectively, control systems, areas for accommodation and recreation of personnel. By the way, the crew of the station is not that big. Thanks to high automation, the work can be handled by only about 70 people. Now, to the source of energy itself. The power plant is equipped with two KLT-40 pressurized water nuclear reactors, created by OKBM Afrikanov. These are already classic ship reactors, which, in addition to Lomonosov, supply energy to several Russian icebreakers. Each reactor produces thermal power of up to 150 megawatts and electrical power of up to 35 megawatts. Due to these reactors, the power plant is capable of delivering 60 megawatts of clean electric energy to the electric grid, plus a significant amount of hot water for heating, plus a huge amount of desalinated water. This may be quite enough to provide a large industrial facility or a small city with a population of about 100,000 people. One of the biggest challenges for nuclear scientists was the need to maximize the period of permanent work on site without interruptions in service. After all, there would be little use for a power plant that every couple of years would have to be disabled and taken to the factory for maintenance. The achievement of the new floating power plant is its own fuel storage and refueling system, which allows it in fact to reload itself. Due to this, the duration of permanent service between maintenances at Lomonosov is extended to 10 to 12 years. In fact, 10 times longer than before. The total service lifetime of the station is presumably up to 40 years. Despite the fact that the power plant is autonomous, it nevertheless cannot work without coastal infrastructure. The energy has to be transferred somewhere. For its fuel-fledged work, the energy receiving equipment is located on the coast, plus some protective structures for the barge, if it is deployed in aggressive regions, for example in the north, where there is a threat of meeting a drifting iceberg. Here usually arises the first security question. A lonely nuclear facility may be damaged, destroyed or sank by storms, icebergs or terrorists. Some opponents of the project have already named it a nuclear titanic or Chernobyl on ice. But the barge, after all, is not a ship and does not imply a kind of constant voyages across the seas and oceans. At the same time, it has multi-level ship protection from external influences, including a double hull structure. The risk of an incident caused by sabotage or a terrorist attack is no higher here than on any other nuclear facility or ship. The security here is tight, and in order to destroy it from the outside, they would probably have to use some anti-ship missiles, which is clearly not the level of extremist gangs. The work was started in 2007. The construction of the barge at the Baltic shipyard in St. Petersburg was initially going quite fast, but because of the economic crisis got stretched over a long period of time. In 2018, Akademik Lomonosov was moved from St. Petersburg to Murmansk to the Atom Flot base, where ships with nuclear power plants are being serviced. There, the reactors were fueled up, launched and tested. Finally, in the fall of 2019, the floating nuclear power plant was deployed to the port of Pevek in Chukotka, where already in 2020 it will supply energy to the customers. Here the second issue emerges. Yes, the reactors have been actively used on ships for a long time, but not a single icebreaker, submarine or aircraft carrier is a power station. Floating nuclear power plants are much more complex, more powerful and therefore more dangerous. Firstly, yes, such stations are unique, but they are a hybrid of ship power plants and industrial power plants, and the nuclear engineers have good experience in creating both. The security of the station and of the reactors inside is at a very high level. After all the incidents in the nuclear industry, the safety issue was put in absolute priority. And secondly, statements about the danger of basing such powerful reactors at the sea are groundless, considering the fact that they are not that powerful. Yes, in fact, the main problem of Akademik Lomonosov is precisely its low power. Creating the first power plant of this type, engineers were careful and applied rather conservative designs. The KLT-40, created back in the USSR in the 1980s, gives a thermal capacity of about 150 megawatts. Decent for ships and not enough for power plants. The cost of the station itself has increased since the start of the work, which made the generated energy too expensive. This is the reason why the creation of Lomonosov will probably not be justified commercially. 
However, this is the first object of this type. The work will be continued, and having the necessary experience, nuclear scientists will be able to implement more effective solutions. At future stations, the 150 megawatt KLT-40 can be replaced by the 175 megawatt Rhythm 200 reactor, or by the promising Rhythm 400 with 315 megawatt, which is twice more than the current figure, plus a significant increase in the operating time between refueling and maintenance. Given that the series production of plants will be cheaper, with a significant increase in energy production, the future floating stations can become a truly commercially attractive option. Many coastal countries, industrial centers and cities will be able to get a powerful and environmentally friendly source that will come to their shores, provide energy, heat and water, and when the time comes, it will simply go back to the factory, leaving without a trace. The problems of construction and in the future disposal and land reclamation will not be faced by the customers. Not a bad option. How effective it will end up being, time will tell. And for today, the brief journey into nuclear power is over. Comment what you think about floating nuclear power plants and make sure to subscribe. There's still a lot of interesting things on the horizon.